Okay. Hi, guys. I hope everybody is doing well. Um, today, we are... Of course, we're still on the parables of Jesus. And today, we're going to talk about the parable of the sheep and the wolves, which is Matthew. We're going to start with Matthew seven fifteen, And we're actually going to do... Um, Matthew chapter 7 verse 15 through 20. So let me go ahead and pray in and we will get started. Most gracious and precious Heavenly Father, I give you all honor, praise, and glory, dear Lord. I thank you for this time, dear Father. I thank you for each and every person who made time out of their day to come to the study group or to listen on YouTube, dear Father. As always, dear Lord, you are our teacher and God, so I invite you into the study group, dear Lord. You lead this group, dear Father. You teach us from your word, dear Lord, for you are our teacher. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. All right, I'm not used to everybody being so quiet, but... <laughs> I'm here. I'm the heavy stuff, so I'm here. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, I got to turn you down some. You was really loud. <laughs> I couldn't tell how loud I had it until somebody spoke. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean oh, no. to talk like <laughs> No, it, it wasn't you. I, ha I just didn't know how loud I had it. Okay. Got it. okay. I got it. Um, <laughs> I got it now. Okay, first verse I want to look at is Matthew. Matthew 7. Uh, let me type it in the room. Matthew 7, verse 15. And that verse says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Okay. So, um, there is a vital connection between this double figure and the one that we, can, uh, we looked at last week. How is the narrow way to be found and who are the authorized guides? Are they not those divinely inspired teachers? Here, our Lord is warning against those counterfeit gods. And uh, the next verse that I want to look at is Acts. Acts chapter 5, verse 39, which says, But if it is, but if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. Okay, so who are the traitors in uh, traitors to their trust? So let me read that again. Who are the author uh, authorized guide, uh, authorized gods, and are they not those divinely inspired teachers? Here, our Lord is warning against those counterfeit gods, as in Acts chapter five, verse thirty-nine. Who? Are traitors to their trust. These false prophets are like wolves disguising themselves as sheep in order to gain entrance into the fold, as seen in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse. Oh no, wait a second. John chapter 10, verse 12. Make sure I wrote that down right. Yeah, 10, 12, and Acts chapter 20, verse 29. And these verses say, But a hareling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. And then also in Acts 20 verse 29 it says, for I, for I know this, that after my departure 
savage wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock. So a prophet may teach a perfectly correct doctrine. Sorry guys, my phone was ringing. Okay, so a prophet may teach a perfectly correct doctrine, but his life is a verse to his teaching. He is a ravening, or ravening wolf, one who inf one whose influence is destructive. We are not to be deceived by our, by outward appearances. On the other hand, the prophet or teacher may come as an authorized expounder of the mind of God, yet be a false guide, as seen in Second Peter. Second Peter, chapter two, verse one through two. Also in First John, First John, chapter four, verse one. And these verses say, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. And then First John chapter 4 verse 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So, hang on. So he may have a... a have a bland, gentle, plausible exterior, as many preachers have, and persuade us that the gate is not straight nor the way narrow, and that to teach uh, teach so is um, restricting your freedom. Is this not what the false prophets of old tried to do in Ezekiel? Chapter one, uh, chapter thirteen. Let me type this in. Ezekiel, Ezekiel, chapter thirteen, verse one through ten. Also, verse twenty-two, and we will read that. That says. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who, prophes who prophesy and say to those who prophesy out of their own heart. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, your, your prophets are like foxes in the desert. You have not gone up into the gaps to build a wall for those excuse me to build a wall for the house of Israel to stand in battle on the day of the Lord they have envisioned a false divination saying thus says the Lord but the Lord has not sent them yet they hope that the word may be confirmed confirmed have you not seen a fruitful vision and have you not spoken false divination you say the lord says but i have not spoken therefore thus says the lord god because you have spoken nonsense and envisioned lies therefore i am indeed against you says the lord god my hand will be against the prophets who envision fruit fertility <clears throat> excuse me and who and who divine lies they shall not be in the assembly of my people 
nor be written in the record of the house of Israel, nor shall they enter into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, because indeed, because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, when there is no peace, and one builds a wall, and they plaster it with untempered mortar. And then verse 22 says, because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and you have strengthened the hands of the wicked, so that he does not turn from his wicked way to save his life. Okay. So, are these not those that Paul also described as being bent on devouring the flocks for their own ends in Corinthians, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, or no, excuse me, chapter 11, verses 2 through 3, also verses... Verses 13 through 15. And them verses say. Okay, verses 2 and 3 say, For I am jealous for, for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chastened virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupt from the simplicity that is in Christ. And then verse 13 through 15 says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transformed himself into an angel of light, Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So, it is not always easy to detect the false prophet in sheep's clothing. Like ba Balaam, Balaam, I think it's Balaam, B-A-L-A-A-M. You all know how I am with these words. He may have marvelous insight, and like Simon Ma Magus, do wonders, or like Satan, seem an angel of light. But the Master gives us a test. You shall know them by their fruits. Here he merges his figures of speech. If false prophets, then they are corrupt trees and cannot bring forth good fruit. What? Is the influence of a pastor or teacher on you if it endures the Savior to you uh, deepens your penance and gratitude heightens your spiritual aspirations intensifies your desire for God your spiritual God is a safe one follow him as he seeks to follow his heavenly God now let's look at the rest of Matthew chapter 7 we're going to look at verse 16, Matthew 7, verse 16 through 20. Oh, sorry. I should have turned back to Matthew. Okay, Matthew chapter 7, verse 16 through 20. It says, You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits 
you will know them. So here, um, evil fruit cannot grow from a good tree. This test of the practical influence of any doctrines on the life is one which all can apply and is the, uh, and is the surest test of truth which any can use. If a tree is corrupt, that is rotten or decayed at the core, it cannot produce good fruit. Wrong thinking leads to wrong living. Falseness in teaching or in the teacher will sooner or later show itself in his life and becomes thereby a teacher whose guidance we cannot follow. Their fruits refers to the practical effect of their teaching. Grapes cannot be gathered from thorns or any kind of prickly fruit, and figs cannot come from thistles. Every tree bears its own fruit. For our own hearts, the teaching is obvious. We recap what we sow. And Galatians chapter 6 verse 7. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he reap. If we are obedient to the will of the Father, then power is ours to distinguish so far as we need distinguish truth from error, human teaching from the divine. Obedience is the final test of everything. Do and thou shalt know. As the father is the husbandman, he can transform the thorn into a fir tree and the briar into a myrtle tree. Bad-natured trees may be changed by divine power and mercy into good trees. The planting of the Lord. Thistles may blo uh, blossom into, rose, into roses fit for the bosom of the king of kings. But if bad trees persist in being bad, then they are honed down and cast into the fire. And that's all I have. <laughs> so, this was about wolves in sheep's clothing, which we see a lot of nowadays. Um, and, um, you know, your fruits. We've discussed our fruits before, you know. Um, good fruit or bad fruit. Uh, a, uh, a person of God will have good fruit. And a person not of God will not have good fruit. Or show good works. Anybody got anything to add? Yeah. Um, I've just spoken I was just making sure you were done finished talking. Can you hear me? Yep, I hear you. Oh, okay. I was just thinking back to um, the days when I wasn't living right for God. And I remember back then, um, anybody that I met or knew that was going to church or, you know, was involved in church activities, I saw everybody that was like that just in sheep's clothing. And it took me coming back to the Lord it almost, I almost went through a mourning period, and I'm kind of still going through it to some degree. When I, when the Lord started exposing all these truths to our hearts, and even to yours too, it's that not everybody who's going to church is right with God. Not everybody's producing the fruit that the Bible tells us we're supposed to produce. So it's, it's kind of like a mourning period, realizing this, you know. Yeah. Yep. I agree. Uh, when when I first come on here, uh, I I assumed every Christian thought alike. I assumed every person who called themselves a Christian was all seeking guidance from God and wanted to follow Jesus. You know. Yeah. yeah. And and sadly, it's not. You see more gossip. And everything, and in my experience, I know there's good churches out there, but the ones that I've been through to 
you you see more gossip you see all these things that's not of god and yeah and then i look back and i think uh, man no wonder i was a weirdo <laughs> i always consider <laughs> myself a weirdo but you know which weirdo i guess in a good way because i didn't want no part of that stuff you know and right. therefore because i didn't fit in with the gossip or um all this other stuff you know i guess i was just the the weirdo <laughs> the weirdo right but um i like that these two was together the wolves in sheep clothing and the uh the good fruit i like that these two was right together yeah because they do go hand in hand together yeah and sadly i found i'll go ahead just a couple thoughts okay something that i've been thinking about and uh, i've been through some other things some podcasts i've mentioned to you before and some things that I felt like I was deceived or would have been deceived if given the chance and seen some things is number one, just like Satan deceives and he has a deception for every type of person. And I wouldn't be deceived for something that might deceive you, but and vice versa. Right. There is a wolf in sheep's clothing, if you will, that you would never be deceived from, but I might. And I think it's important to rely on each other to ask questions and, and get guidance because because they're out there and we, we all get deceived in our own way. And some do come quietly and meekly in and they're, uh, they're a wolf, but some, some come in a different way that might, um, you know, more bombastic. And, and in that aspect, I kind of learned something about myself that would be more deceptive to me. Mm-hmm. Now, my wife, it wouldn't deceive her nearly as much. Um, and, and, and so, and, but the, it's a wolf nevertheless. And um, so, you know, it's important to be together. And then the other thing is, is on top of that, we have to remember also that a church is made up of sinners. Mm-hmm. And um, so not, so every church has their own problems. Right. And um, the key isn't that they have problems. The key is is that if they're working to solve those problems, right? And they'll have those for etern- for for until we get glorified. Mm-hmm. And and so you know, if you're at a church, you know, you're not going to find a church that doesn't have that pro- those problems. Right. And I've never myself felt really. I've always felt a little out of place at church, but I think most people do. It's maybe because of that. Maybe that's the deception. That's a deception in and of itself, is to feel out of place and not feel like you have a home. Well, now well, I- he just spoke with so much wisdom. Both of those points, big time, mm-hmm. straight from the Holy Spirit. Thank you for sharing that. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't go that far, but thank you. <laughs> I used gossip well, it, as I just used gossip as a uh, example there. <laughs> I well, just, the, it's 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 hard for for me me personally. What I look for in a church is truth, God's truth from His Word, not watered down. Not um, if we're speaking or preaching God's truth, then that's a good church. But if they are behind the pulpit making fun of people, which I have seen, and um, um, uh, making comments, uh, don't pray for the ones that can't give to the church, and which you know, all these things are examples that I've I've, I've witnessed from people. Uh, then that's not a church that I want to be involved with. Right, and on an individual thing, um, I have also witnessed these things, and two things that I, two things that I would, when you're looking at, especially a leader, things to give caution about. Number one is their private life. You know, a lot of times mm-hmm. it's about fruit. Well, the fruit should be in their private life. Exactly. 
and and if and if it's not good or if they say things they shouldn't say and that doesn't mean they're sinless that just means they're working on it and they know they're humble about it and they know they're working on it um and they try not to you know and it's an effort and they're struggling you mm -hmm. the, the the truth is in the struggle right and then the other thing is is you know let's try I, I think I might have lost my train of thought you go ahead I, I think I think you're right it it is um, it's not something that they should just be living on Sundays or Wednesdays or whenever they go to church it's something that they should be living every single day um, I, I remember what I was thinking okay I spent most of my time growing up well my dad my dad obviously is a pastor um, half of that time that I was in his house he, it was non-denominational mm -hmm. it was um, specifically so because that's how they established churches in, in communities that didn't have them they started churches and then uh, and then he was into a they were Baptist uh, uh, as younger and they were went back into and pastor Baptist churches and the one thing I can say, and I can't speak for everyone, and you know, I just have limited experience, is I've been in a lot of churches that spoke truth. But the problem is, as I see it, they didn't they didn't seem to encourage, and I see this everywhere, enough of a relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And you can know a lot of Bible. Yep. But you know, Jesus is the one that changes hearts. And the Bible is supposed to lead us to a deeper relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And um, then there's not many people have a relationship with Jesus. Absolutely. I agree with that. There is a huge, huge difference. And, you know, I've said it before. There's a huge difference from head knowledge and heart knowledge. You can know every single thing in this Bible. You can know it frontward and backward and memorize every verse in it. But that does not mean that your heart is right with God, that you have that relationship with God. You know, it's all about a relationship. There's a big difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge. And it's the heart knowledge that I want. And honestly, the head knowledge isn't worth a whole lot. Yeah. That's my testimony. It's all the years I was still watching uh, Bible prophecy, and I didn't really mean to think this, but I guess I thought in my mind, well, when I see things start speeding up, I'll get right with God, but that's not the case. Nobody should think like that. I had to learn, I knew a lot of Bible truth, but I was still going to bust hell wide open. I did not have a relationship with the Lord. I was not applying these scriptures to my heart. And over 10 years ago, the Lord convicted me so strongly of that to where I didn't even know what I was missing out on. That's why sometimes I feel sorry for people who've never experienced a true living relationship with the Lord and experience his refining fire in your heart to make you more like him is such a supernatural work people wouldn't be able to live lukewarm or even go back to the world if they experienced that but the Lord had to rebuke me for all that because I had a lot of Bible knowledge Bible prophecy and the other but I wasn't applying it to my life and I still would have died and went to hell and I probably would have been judged even harsher because I knew all that that Bible stuff and still didn't choose to follow and walk in the you know walk in the right relationship with God so that's a good point to make mm -hmm. well I honestly think that a lot of Bible or uh, relationship with God the Father with Jesus with God the Father is not taught because their leadership never was taught. I think this is a multi generational problem. Oh, yeah. yeah there are very mm -hmm. few that actually know what really that looks like and what that means. And there's a lot of people trying. Uh, they, they are trying, and it's very defeating for them. I gotta say, 
I knew so much Bible theology, you know. I studied Calvin, I studied, I mean, talk about the people I read and studied, but I had to forget all that to find Jesus, you know, mm -hmm. in, 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 a, in a more real way. And um, I think that's a problem. I think that's a, I think that's a significant problem, at least in the churches I've been in, in Baptist churches. I don't think that's necessarily a problem on the other side of the spectrum, but they have their own problems, and I think that they're deceived in a different way. Yeah, it's the um, it's the traditions of men. Uh, there's more traditions of men taught in church than truth of scripture, or, or uh, at, like you, you're just talking about uh, having a true relationship with God the Father and a relationship with Jesus, and taught how to um, that we're supposed to walk as Jesus. Uh, did um, it says in scripture how we're supposed to you know of course I'm paraphrasing but Jesus is our our huge best example of how we're supposed to live our lives uh, and we should walk like Jesus walked and that's not taught in in churches uh, having a relationship with the father is is not taught in church it's all more about traditions of man that has seeped in to <laughs> that has seeped into the uh, the church from, uh, starting way back in uh, the apostles' time. You know, uh, uh, I've always said it: a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You got that little bit that crept in, and it seeps in, and more and more started seeping in through the churches until what it is today and I don't think I think in my opinion I would say at least 95% of the churches is not is not um, uh, living or teaching like they were supposed to if you go back to what how we're supposed to be doing back from the apostles, the true teachings from the apostles, from Paul, from, you know, I think more churches need to go back to that. And when they go back to that, that's when you will see uh, more, more things start to happen, like happened back in them days. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? Or am I rambling? Mm -hmm. Uh, but you've got sin that has crept in and people has just been acceptant of it they start accepting this little thing and this little thing and I'm uh, I won't get started on it all but you all know how I feel about traditions <laughs> everybody knows you've got, you've got a lot of churches that are just straight up false doctrine all the way around oh, yeah. then you've got People like the Baptists that are very good about teaching the Word of God, but they don't have enough of the supernatural power of God. And then you've got the Pentecostal that has, they don't teach the Word of God enough, and they're all about the spirituality. They go too far to the right, too far to the left. There's no middle ground like the Apostles were teaching in their day. They taught the Word, and they moved in the power of the Holy Spirit all in a correct balance it wasn't one side too much or one side the other way they had the correct balance well for one because they had the spirit of god in them and they were walking that walk and they were the churches today you know people can be in church for 10 15 20 years and they're still on the milk of the word of god mm -hmm. they're not being told to go home and study the word for themselves People should be going. People who know God should be going every Sunday to hear a confirmation for what God has been telling them all week. Because they should be walking so close to the Lord that they're not necessarily going to be um, taught to milk the Word. They're going to start hearing the Holy Spirit speak to them about what they've been studying and what they've been talking to the Lord about in prayer all week. But mm -hmm. so many Christians 
are just on the milk. They don't even crack their Bibles open once they get home. And they believe because they're in church on Sunday and sometimes Wednesdays or whenever they go, they believe that's enough. That's all they need. They're not hungry for the Word of God. They're supposed to be disciples. They're supposed to be going out and, and spreading the gospel and telling what God has done for them and what God can do for others. There's, mm -hmm. you're, they're just constantly coming to the church, sitting there to be fed milk. There's no balance. Yeah, there's there's no growth. And that goes back to it's not being taught in the churches. It's uh, that um, you should grow. You should, uh, um, you know, that there's, there's... See, one of the biggest problems that I've always had with churches is when a person gets saved. When a person first gets saved... They pat them on the back, give them a hug, reach them a Bible, and, that, and then that's the extent of it. I mean, they're, they're, nobody tells them how um, they should read their Bible and, and grow in Christ. That It's a growth process. That's how a relationship is formed with our Father. That's how a relationship is formed with Jesus. It's growth. Um, you, you all have heard me say this many times. You know, uh, when I first met my husband, I didn't walk up to him and say, hey, uh, yeah, let's go get married. You know, <laughs> a, a relationship, you grow in a relationship, you know, it's not an instantan instantaneous thing. Um, and, and just what you were talking about, um, you know, that's... <sighs> by people just lit, not cracking open their Bibles and searching for truth themselves. They're just going by what people say. What the uh, Say you go to church, you're just listening to the pastor of the church and you're not reading it for yourself. That's how people will get deceived. And that is exactly what we're talking about today is the false prophets and the wolves in sheep's clothing. Yeah. That is ex the perfect example because if you're not seeking for the truth yourself, you will be deceived. You know? I, um, I'd like to give you an idea, and it's not something I'm definitely dogmatic about, but I, I would like you to think about something, and that is the early church. Uh, the early church, they didn't have the Bible. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And they did not they did not read the Bible daily. They didn't have it. Mm -hmm. um, they had some of the Old Testament. But the way that they walked, and the way they learned to walk with God is by daily coming together, sharing with each other, and encouraging one another to have this walk with God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talk about living like Jesus did, but I don't think we even understand that that's not actually how he it's not what he did it's how he relied on god the father mm -hmm. and how it was a total life of reliance was what he did not you know not how he actually lived and we t tend to look at his acts and not the character and how and that walking with god the father and i'm just i just don't think in my life i i think of many people that really understand and I've been told I was wrong a lot about this, that it's not about living a moral life. God, that's, that, that comes as a result, but too many times we try to think that we read the Bible and so we live a moral life, and that's what we want. And that's not what God wants. It's about this relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and then that leads us to a moral life. And uh, God, the sinning part of it is a lot less important the not sinning part of it is a lot less important to God than the relationship. Because the sins have been taken care of. Yeah, but you got to remember, um, you can't live in habitual sin. You can't well, continue in sin. If you're living, if you're living with Jesus, and you're, and you're living with Him, and you have a relationship with Him, it's not possible to live in habitual sin. Right, I agree with you there. A lot of people don't yeah. understand, though, uh, that aspect of it. And they think that as long as they believe 
in Jesus and live, um, well, as long as they believe in Jesus, that they can continue in their sin because their sins have been taken care of by Jesus, which is true. Their sins have been taken care of by Jesus. But in Scripture, it goes on to say that you cannot continue in that sin. Um, don't continue in it. People stop at baptism and they stop at water baptism. They want nothing to do with the power of the Holy Spirit. They do want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. They're good. They're like, okay, I've had enough. I've been saved. I've, I've, I've been baptized in water. But they, the enemy has done a great job in the last 50 years not teaching the power of the Holy Spirit because that's what get, that's who refines us. Mm -hmm. The power the power of God burns up the chaff in us so that we have we're walking in his spirit and in right. his boldness that people that's why people can't do it because yes they've gotten a measure of the spirit at salvation they went and been water baptized some people depending on you know if they're on their deathbed but nobody wants anything to do with the power of the holy spirit nobody wants to be baptized in the holy ghost and in fire that's why we have a helper you know, it's it's amazing to me that everybody that calls themselves a Christian wants everything the Lord has to give. But the one gift that he gave that he promised to give us as a helper is to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and with fire. Nobody wants anything to do with that. That's where we're that's where we're no longer walking in our flesh and it's the Holy Ghost that takes over that keeps us on that narrow path right. that keeps us walking our holy life and combined with studying the word and praying you know and I agree with you you James and and Tracy um, you know once you do and once you do believe in Christ and everything you know it, it's it's the Holy Spirit that teaches you and guides you and helps clean you up afterwards. But we have to... Uh, the hardest thing for a person to do is give control over to somebody else. And we have to give that control over to God to clean us up. And there's people, there's people who, who don't really understand that. That... Um, uh, you know, and then once you, once God starts working on you, you, all these desires to do whatever it is uh, that people do, you know, drinking or whatever the, the sin is in their life, I don't know, lying, adultery, fornication, whatever it may be, the sin that people are struggling with, you know, once you, once you pet your mind more on Christ and he starts cleaning you up that desire to do that is gone you don't desire to go and tell a lie or go and commit adultery or go and fornicate or go and you know do whatever you know he starts removing these things and that's just what Tracy's talking about he's refining you and you know sometimes sometimes it's not pretty he will remove people from your life, people that you love. He will remove yep. people from your life and everything. You know, sometimes it's not pretty and, and and everything, but he's doing it. And as long as you give him control and allow him to do it and not hold on to that, you know, um, he. I'm, I'm, I'll use this in as as an an example. He removed someone very close to me out of my life. And uh, if I hung on to that person, then I wasn't giving God control. Mm -hmm. I gotta be honest with you. The uh, I have not found that to be true. That the desires of my life have have gone away. What what I have found out though, and differently, is that my love for God is just more important to me. Mm -hmm. And my relationship with him is more important. And to live in that lifestyle that maybe, you know, my the dark places of my heart wants to live, um, I can't have that. And so my love for God is just burns brighter. I, and that's God working on you, James. That I mean, the, every one of us 
has something in our life, a temptation that the devil is going to throw at us. The devil knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows exactly how to get to us. And I'll tell you, the person that he removed from my life was my own son. You know, I haven't spoken to him in over five years. So I know how hard it is. But it's... um, He... he, We have to give control to him because... Uh, to God because he knows what's best for us. Satan knows exactly what to get to us. He knew at that time it was my son that would crush me. Crush me. And my choice was at that time continue with my walk with Jesus even though my son rebelled against me. Continue with my walk with Jesus or give in to Satan and tell my son oh no it's okay it's okay you know I give up my religion you know just come home you know that was a hard decision but I continue walking with Jesus even though my son refuses to talk to me Um, but he Satan knows exactly sorry I'm getting emotional (laughs) Uh, Satan knows exactly what will get to us and what will crush us. And um, he, he knows my kids are a big thing. So he knows how to use the, them against me. But we have, to, we have that free will to continue on or give in to Satan, give in to the sin, give in to whatever, you know. Um, and I, I forgot what I was where I was going with this, but anyway, we have to we have to give control over to the Holy Spirit to work in our lives because if I would have given in to my son five years ago, oh yeah, I, I I would probably be happy. Oh yeah, my son would be here with me. You know, what's greater than your kids being with you as a parent? But would I be where I'm at with Jesus? No, nope. I probably and you're doing better letting this happen because you're praying for him and you're giving him a better chance for yeah. God to get a hold of him. It may be hard because you're the mom because I don't know, but in the end, you're giving God more of an opportunity versus you compromising your walk with the Lord. Then he may never find salvation. Right. But because of sin, you're actually showing him more love. One day he'll realize that. Because, see, God's going to see your heart, and in return, God is going to save them. That's exactly what's going to happen. And it will probably be radical. You'll probably be more radically saved than your other children, just because that's the one that the enemy targeted the most. Mm -hmm. So God sees you and what you've had through for the sake of the gospel, which means your son eventually is going to wake up and see this, because he has a God that loves him that will not stop pursuing him. But Mm -hmm. you're right. We have to let go of things. But it's when it comes to your children, that's like, it's hard. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, I I had to come to a point. I had to give control over to God. I mean, I had to because I went for at least three years with that crushing me, crushing my spirit, hindering my walk with God, hindering Mm -hmm. it, you know. Uh, but I had to come to a point that I was just like, Lord, I give all my kids over to you. I I'm, I can't w- sit here and worry about them and stress about them and, you know, um, think of all the things that I could have changed in my life, you know. <laughs> but none of that would help anything. I had to give full control control of my life and my kids over to God. <laughs> point blank had to and once you come to a point like that and you just start focusing on God all these other little all these things will start coming together you'll start seeing God move you'll start see him, seeing him move in your life in your family's life in your children's life you know and yeah. you know, my son still hasn't come around he still hasn't talked to me um, but 
you know, I see God working in my in my daughters, you know. I see God working oh. in my husband, you know. So Yeah. I can say and in my life I um you know, growing up in a family who 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 uh pastor's family and such that um church is is something very different that I like uh, that uh, than other people have. And I worked very hard, and I tried to seek God through all the ministry and hard work that I put in. And I got to the place, especially with my disability and other things that happened, that uh, you know I felt abandoned, and I had to tell, and I literally told God that I can't do it anymore, that it's too hard, and I can't do, I can't live that life anymore. And. And it was true. I was just, I, I mean, it was, I had some crushing blows. And, you know, it took someone at a church. Uh, I still go to church for my wife and kids. I literally thought I was going to hell. Um, to just love me. To show me a little bit of love. Mm -hmm. And it opened up a door that I heard God saying, you know, all those, all those things you did, they were nice. But that's not really what I wanted. I wanted to talk to you. And it opened a door, crack in the door where we could whisper back and forth with him, and he was willing to sit there on the other side of a cracked door and whisper at me, and show me love. And now I don't, I don't do nearly as much as I did before. But I'm doing what, but but I think God never really wanted those things. He wanted me just to be with him, to walk with him, to be with him, and to, to and that he could love me and I could love him. And I think it's more important. Everything else, it doesn't doesn't really matter. But what God wants, and some of those things that I did, really good things came out of it. Um, really good things came out. But at the same time, I kind of look back and wonder how much I was really should have been doing, and then and instead doing the greater thing of just following and just having a loving relationship with God. That's. I question that, and that's where I've come from, and that's some of the things that I say comes from. Is that maybe, maybe I work so hard. Maybe instead of doing the stuff, we need to sit down quietly and pray and do the hard. Do sometimes it's hard. So, so a lot of times now it's easy to just talk and be with Him. Mm -hmm. And that's what God wants out of me. Yeah, every everybody's walk is is not going to be the same. Um, God has um, um, that's why there there are different gifts of the spirit and different you know there's teachers and prophets and pastors and you know all these other things. Um, there's different gifts. There's prophecy and tongues and interpretation of tongues and uh, discernment and all these other gifts. You know. Uh, everybody's walk is going to be different. Uh, that that may be what he wants you to do, you know. And then uh, uh, he may have something else for Tracy, you know. Um, but we all main 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 thing. We all have to make time, quiet time, every day with him. That's how you get a relationship. That's how you keep a relationship with a person. You spend time with them. If I never spent time with my husband, do you think we'd have a relationship? No. Nope. I haven't spoken to my son in five years. If I passed him on the street, I don't even know if I would know him. You know? What What could we sit down and have a conversation about unless it was past things? You know? I know nothing about his life right now because there's not a relationship there well I'm convinced the relationship comes first and how to live and what he wants you to do what mm -hmm. activities he wants you to be involved with come later and it might yeah. be months later maybe maybe he'll tell you two months from now what he wants to do and maybe he'll tell you five years Yeah, but they'll come later I and he'll agree. tell you. Oh yeah, I completely you agree with in you. Obedience. The closer you get to him, you start walking in obedience. Yep. He says, "If you love me, you'll obey me." You start obeying his word. You start walking in 
you worked out your own salvation with fear and trembling and when, once you go closer to him he starts convicting you of things he doesn't want you to do he raised something on your heart he wants you to pray about you stay in his word People won't stay in the Word long enough to even know that they're doing something wrong. They don't know that, hey, I'm not supposed to be, you know, envying somebody else's lifestyle, or I'm not supposed to be, you know. You, and there's things that we all differently struggle different. Like one person might struggle with a temper, and they've really got to pray and seek the Lord because it's become a stronghold in their life. And they've just got to keep seeking the Lord till they get victory. That's where our testimony comes in. Our testimony comes in and I've said this before. But where's the testimony of people just walking around with a Jesus teacher? If they've been set free of anger, if they've been able to love their enemies the way they're supposed to, are they walking in the truth? Are they walking in obedience to God's word? Are they a peculiar people? Are they a holy people? We can't walk in this in our flesh. We have to have the power of the Holy Spirit to fully walk it out because the Holy Spirit completed all that work for us. His blood shed on the cross completed that. His Spirit gives us the strength to obey Him that way. And then it's no longer a work of the flesh. So spending that time with Him is beyond vital because just like you're not talking to your son for five years, sometimes the Lord will let us in our life. If He loved us enough, and if we're not walking as close with him as he wants us to, he will allow our love to fall apart until we are on our face before him. And it might look different for every other person. But he will let us get rock with him so that he becomes our everything. And some people fail when that refining fire starts hitting somebody's life. You know, they sometimes they don't make it. They don't make it through it. They can't recognize that God's trying to get them in relationship with him. If you don't have that relationship, that's the number one key, is to get in a relationship, turn from all known sin, continue to walk in obedience, continue to hear his voice, you know, and be a peculiar people in the earth. Mm -hmm. Well, there's also the principle that if you want something, you have to lose it. And uh, that's just, Jesus talked about that quite a bit. And, uh, but yeah, and I, and I find that to be true in my life. It gives us new desires in our heart. Mm -hmm. Some people take that and twist it and say, the Lord gives us the desires of our heart. Well, I want that big house or I want that big car. And they're taking that scripture wrong in saying that. They're not realizing he gives us new desires in our heart. That we no longer want those things that we shouldn't anymore. Mm -hmm. it's, you just don't. The Holy Spirit burns it up in you. He is a consuming fire. He burns that stuff up in us. Does the enemy come along years later and try to tempt us just to see if that, if you've kept that oil in your lamp? Are you, are you made up? Are you still walking with, because it's a continual thing. You can't live off of last year's anointing in your life. You can't live off of last year's, the God has said, if she didn't talk to her son, what would they have to talk about but the past? You can't live off of last year. You spent four days with him last year and expect to have any discernment a year later if you've not been having the relationship with him but his fire comes gives us new desires in our hearts we start burning for things that we never burned about or wanted before because that's then you're starting to walk in the will of god for your life and those old things those old desires pain melt away that's the testimony that his spirit doesn't just come and save us it comes and burns up everything in us not like him Yep. You know, one of my uh, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is Romans twelve, verses one and two. It says, "I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God." which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
that you may prove yes. what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that is one of my favorite verses and one of the verses that I, I've, that's always stuck with me because I think that verse can be used in anything in our lives. Um, we don't want to conform to this world and the worldly things going on. And that's the problem that I had with my son. He was more into the worldly things and we bashed heads and he didn't like uh, my views on uh, worldly things because of my religion. Um, and uh, so we can't conform to this world, but we're, we're renewed by the, uh, we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. And how do you get that renewing of your mind? You get that by studying and meditating. Meditating means thinking upon the things of God, upon His Word, studying His Word and uh, meditating upon God. And what, you know, thinking about, you know, you may read a chapter a day and uh, don't just read it and then close your Bible and then go on about your day doing house chores or anything. Or, or if you do, I mean... You know, school started and everything, you know. You may have to take kids to school or grandkids or whatever. But don't just let that be the end of it. Close the Bible and that's the end of it. Think upon what you've read. Be talking to God all throughout the day, you know, about what you've read and, you know, different things. Keep your mind upon God. Because what's uh, in Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah. Yeah, Isaiah 26, 3, it says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon you because he trusts you. We've got to trust God with everything in our lives. Everything in our lives. Just like I trust God with my children. I trust him with my son. I trust him with my daughters. You know, and that's how, that's, that's the only way I can get peace about it. You know, is given control over to God with my children. We got to. I call it the. Uh, I call it the uh, in my life the formal and the informal. I have formal times when I'm with God and I'm trying to you know have that time in the Bible and mm -hmm. prayer and such, and then the rest of the time I really work at trying to have informal. Where he's with me the entire time, where I ask him questions, well, even the mundane, try to ask him things and whatnot, and have him a part of my life. Because I, I got to tell you, if I'm not continuously marinating myself in him, that means I'm marinating in the world, and I get all messed up. Mm -hmm. You should talk to God about everything, and, and this might sound silly to a lot of people, but I don't do this all the time, but... I have, <laughs> I have been driving down the road, going to the grocery store, and I stop, and I pull over, and, well, it's actually a stop sign, and I can either turn to the left or turn to the right, depending on what store I want to go to, and I have actually sat there at that stop sign and talked to God and said, Lord, you know how much money I have, you know how much I've got, I have to spend at the store lead me to the place that I should go that I can that I can do best that you know talk to him about everything and he he will help you in every everything and he will answer you know that that may sound silly to to some people but you know ask God everything everything in your life ask yeah him. I agree that's not silly and that's what I call the informal. Yeah. It's just the informal of, can you come with me? Mm -hmm. You know, there's times that I, you know, my wife will go to the store and I'll ask to go with her. Not because it's easy, because I, you know, it's hard for me to get around and whatnot. But I just want to be with her. Right. And uh, so I want, I want God just to be with me. Yeah. Like you said, you know, I, you just want to talk to God about which way to go. You know, it's right. not. This isn't, this isn't that big a deal, but it doesn't have to be a big deal. You just want to be with them. Right. Yeah. 
I don't know how people make it in the world without him. There's no, there's not one thing in this life that we don't need him for. Mm -hmm. He's our creator. There, he wants us to be utterly dependent upon him for everything. Well, the world gives you, Satan gives you a deception for uh, and a substitution for everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can be sports, sometimes it can be politics, sometimes it can be some type of craft, sometimes it can be, you know, different groups that you get involved in with dance or with, with you know, different things. Everyone, he has a deception for everyone. Yeah. And when you get past that deception, a lot of times you just fall to another level of deception. Yeah, and um, and, and that's, that's what, what I, I see all over. You know, I see, I see these people online that talk about, well, I got, you know, uh, I don't know what it's called, blue pilled or whatever they call it, or black pilled or white pilled. I don't even understand it at all. But I watched that and I saw them falling to another level of deception. Yeah, they found a truth and they fell fell to the next level of deception because Satan has set up levels of deception. It's like a croissant. There's all types of levels in there, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, I, I just see that, and, and I see people doing that, and it hurts my heart, but they don't, you know, they don't want to come to Christ, and a lot of them are going to reject Christ at the very end, to the very end, and that has to be their decision. Yeah. So he's done real good at making us more busier than we've ever been with technology and more movies and you know, and watch Netflix, and you got this going on and that. You know, I envy the people that lived in the 1920s that actually had time to eat dinner with their family, actually had time to get up and do Bible studies together with their family. There was no TV to cut on, you know, there was no cell phones that had time to seek the Lord. And we are in such a fast paced, moving society. That it's uh, it's intentional by the enemy giving us all these distractions. And you're right, I've seen a lot of people fall. I said this over the years about different um, secular uh, drug and alcohol rehabilitation places. Because they're missing the one aspect, the only person who can truly deliver them is the Lord. These secular places, you know, teach. They've got you know, 10, 10 steps this, 10 steps that, and some people come out and they're delivered for six months. And then the enemy comes back and tries to get them with something else. They're addicted to something else or something. It's just the cycle never ends because the only one who can truly set free is the Lord. And a lot of these people, now there are some of them that may not ever get back on drugs or alcohol, but then they become addicted to success and prosperity and it's something else that, it, like, like he just said, the enemy replaces it. They go from one deception to another deception because they're, everybody's dancing around getting their lives right with the one true and living God. They may want religion, but they're wanting to pick all these religions that have nothing to do with the gospel of Christ, and yet they're still not being set free because he's the only freedom we can have. I mean, I commend these forces that you know, offer a free, you know, offer rehabilitation and stuff like that. Again, it's a good work, quote unquote. But at the end of the day, these people are only going to be set free for so long because the the, the fire of God has not entered their heart to keep them from going into another deception or another addiction. You know. Yeah. Yep, you're absolutely right. And they're just as replacements for who God created us to need, and that was Him. Yeah. And I get it. I know how hard it can, how much it can hurt. I know what it can, it looks like to see your loved ones in pain, and it breaks your heart, but you gotta give it up. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And then, I mean, I, one of the big things with me is, is you know, one of my big things, like, I can get into politics and be engulfed in it in no time. And I have to stay away from it all. And it's a, if it's a thing of this world, it's all controlled by Satan, and i got to stay away. But it's so easy for me to get sucked right in. 
And so I work at that. I work at it all day long, every day. That no, I'm gonna. Well, what about this? Or because you hear stuff, you just can't even be in the world and not hear stuff. No, I'm not gonna look at that. I'm gonna look because God's in control. Nope, God's in control. Always back to God's in control. That's me. I. I used to have that problem with um, any reality shows. Even if they were, they were always usually good ones. Well, they weren't bad. But I used to have that problem years ago with watching um, like 19 Kids and Counting and Counting On. And I loved reality shows. I don't like scripted stuff. I like stuff that's like, you know, I would call it a lot of that kind of stuff. And it took a good few years for it to be totally out of me. Now I have no desire for it at all. But um, if I walk in the room and somebody's watching, I kind of listen. Like, oh, what's happening now? But um, it was something that took up my time to spend with the Lord that, you know, especially when you're working a lot, you need that extra time to be with Him, not to choose to be addicted to some TV show. You know, so we all have something. In politics nowadays, it's, it's not even worth getting in it. You know, that, nowadays it's just so corrupt, it's not even worth. You can get caught up in it and get in the hype and all of it, but at the end of the day, I mean, not even God is for one side or the other. He's saying, I'm just standing here, like that, like he said in the Bible, I'm not for you or against you. I'm standing here as the one true God. And, you know, both sides are so corrupt now, it's... Gosh, I used to be in the politics real bad too, though. When George Bush was in office, all the way up until Obama, and then once Trump got in, I was out of politics. I didn't care for it anymore. I didn't look at either side because they're both corrupt. And but I know what you mean because I used to. Mine was with reality show TV TV shows, but I know what you mean about politics. No, it's just easy for me to get caught up, and but even mm -hmm. that is like. Is like relying on some type of politics to to uh, some some person. You're you're not going to the, the true savior, you know. Right. But reality, my goodness, you know, my wife at work and she comes home and talks about all these reality shows that the people she works with are into, and it's like, and I go and we talk about that. It, I, yeah, I think reality shows oftentimes are. Um, are especially made to entrap the ladies, but because guys are more into our reality shows or sports or you know or politics, yeah. matter, but sports, and so everything's so designed to catch us. And if we don't get caught in one net, we get caught in the net the uh, the next. And yeah. uh, and the only way to stay out of that is to have our uh, all of our focus on God all the time and really really be with Him and doing. In my life, it, it's taken me doing the things I don't like doing to really find him, and and, the, and then it's a joy. It's been a joy. Right. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about that this morning. Well, I hope you all got something out of today. Definitely. That was good. And that one scripture you just read was absolutely perfect. You couldn't have picked. The Holy Spirit gave you that to read because that was just perfect. Reading. I can't tell you. All my studies today have been about be careful of the world and been and this isn't too far from it it's just right in revolve around the same thing and I read a little bit in Nehemiah I went through some in Corinthians I have a couple uh, uh, devotionals I looked at this morning um, I looked at a um, psalm and all of them are about the same thing is keep your focus on God and God will lead you and I think the same thing you're talking about we keep our focus on God God will tell us who to follow and who is the wolf but we got to keep our focus on God. Yep. Oh, well, let me go ahead and pray out then. Most gracious and precious Heavenly Father, I give you all honor, praise, and glory, dear Lord. I thank you for each and every person that come to this study today, dear Lord, and I thank you 
for Miss Barbara. I see her in here today, dear Lord, and I thank you for giving her strength and stuff to come to the study group today, dear Lord, and I ask that you continue to put your hand of protection around her and you heal her body completely, dear Father. I also ask, dear Lord, that you keep your hand of protection around each and every one of us, dear Lord. Lead and guide us, dear Lord. Give us discernment to know who the wolves are, dear Father, that we're not deceived in these last days, dear Lord. Lead and guide us until we meet again, dear Father, in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.